You know, if you had told me that at the start of the year, The Snowman, one of my most anticipated movies of 2017, would be one of my picks for worst of the year, I'd have probably laughed at you. Are you serious? I mean, how could this movie possibly be bad? It is a talented director in the form of Tom Salfredson, a Swedish filmmaker known for Let the Right One in the Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. It has a great cast with Michael Fassbender, Rebecca Ferguson, Charlotte Gainsborough, Toby Jones, Val Kilmer, and J.K. Simmons, just to name a few. It's based on a best selling book. It's got a dark and ominous wintertime setting with snowy backdrops, very reminiscent of Steve Larson's Millennium series. And with all of that going for it, what could possibly go wrong? But you know, even with all that going against it, I was still hoping for the best. I went into this movie wanting to like it, because I have liked movies before that haven't really gotten great reviews from critics and have been kind of rejected by audiences like Mother, Cure for Wellness, Kings from the Golden Circle. So going into The Snowman, my mind was as open as it could possibly be. For about two minutes. And as the movie unfolded, I began to realise that The Snowman is probably the most maddening and disappointing movie I have seen so far this year. I was expecting something that would be mediocre at worst, but not something this messy or this sloppily put together. So instead of doing a review the way I normally do as part of my first impressions series, I'm going to do something a little different for The Snowman. I'm going to break down the movie's plot, characters, performances, directing and anything else to see where the movie goes so wrong, and hopefully find something positive to say about the film, as I attempt to answer the question what the hell happened to the snowman? Let's begin by taking a look at the plot. The movie is set in Norway where Michael Fassbender's Harry Hull, yes that's how it's pronounced, it's a Norwegian thing, is a gifted detective struggling with alcohol, insomnia and being separated from his wife and son. He befriends Catherine Brat Plipper Rebecca Ferguson, a new recruit straight out of the academy, and the pair attempt to solve a series of strange disappearances that are marked by snowmen. As the case goes on, both of them have reason to believe that they're dealing with a serial killer, and now it's a race against time for them to figure out the killer's identity before he strikes again. The plot sounds okay and kind of generic on paper, but with the right execution, it could definitely make for an intriguing and exciting movie. Unfortunately, one of the main problems with the movie's plot is that there's little to no mystery to it. Right from the outset, we're shown the killer's motivation in a flashback that puts the viewer multiple steps ahead of our lead characters. It's just such a wrong-headed way of starting the movie, it just kills it right out of the gate ruining whatever little mystery there might have otherwise been. Because you know pretty much what the killer is doing and why he does it, and you're just sitting there waiting for Hole to figure out what the audience already knows. I'll bring the scene up again at the end when I talk about the movie's biggest flaw, but either way, I think it's a very misguided way of starting the movie. And the plot itself is completely convoluted with all these different subplots that feel like they have no other purpose than to try and distract you from how surprisingly simple the murder mystery is. There's so many plot points that are just thrown together with very little cohesion that I honestly find it very hard trying to figure out what was going on in certain scenes and how they actually connect to the story. And in all honesty, they don't really connect to the plot all that much. There's this subplot involving an abortionist who's keeping these women in his home and you think that might be going somewhere, but then it's resolved so abruptly that you wonder, why was that even in the movie? What point did that serve in the overall story that I know just being a pointless red herring? There's also a subplot involving J.K. Simmons as this entrepreneur who's behind the Norwegian bid for the Winter Games, but Holman Brat find out that he's actually a sexual predator and that the doctor is actually pimping women for him. However, neither of these subplots actually tie into the overarching storyline and just bog the movie down. And the Winter Games subplot is given way too much focus before it stops with no resolution whatsoever. There may have been scenes that tie these subplots to the actual film, but for some reason, there's barely anything tying all these plot threads together. This could probably be an issue with the editing, and I'll get to that later on in the video, but suffice to say, the subplots do nothing but distract from the movie's overall premise. And then there's also these weird flashbacks of Val Kilmer as another detective from several years ago, which is something that could have possibly worked, because you can tell that they're trying to create parallels between him and Hul, in the sense that they're both obsessed with figuring out who the murderer is, they're both alcoholics, but both very gifted detectives at the same time. However, the transitions between past and present feel jarring, the storytelling and structure is just sloppy and it doesn't help that the subplot is again discarded very abruptly when it's revealed that Kilmer supposedly committed suicide, even though it's pretty obvious that he didn't. Overall, the plot has some interesting ideas and in a much better film the story could have been very intriguing, but the storytelling is just sloppy, it's jumbled with too many subplots fighting for attention that are never resolved or are given way too much focus. And this leads me on to my next point which is the characters. One of the main problems with this movie is that Hul isn't a very interesting character. He's supposed to be the skilled and gifted detective despite his alcoholism and his failure as a father, but that's not the impression I get from the film. 
He's more like a drunken, miserable wreck that doesn't really do much except stand around and mope all day. Not to mention, because the mystery is so predictable, it actually undermines who the supposed skills as a detective. And poor Michael Fassbender is trying desperately to make this character work, but he's constantly left out by just how much of a blank shell who it is. I haven't read any of the books, admittedly, but from what I've heard, he seems like a much more interesting and compelling character there than he's presented as here. There's also a lot of screen time devoted to his relationship with his family, which are easily some of the better moments in the film because they almost ground the character of Hul and manage to give him a sense of humanity. There's a couple of decent moments between him and his illegitimate son, but they're very few and far between, and they mostly just feel like your typical workaholic dad cliched stuff. But aside from that, you never really figure out much about Hul as a character, and you never learn why he is the way he is. It really feels like you're just thrown into the middle of his life and given very little context or even any reason to care about what happens to him. And none of the other characters really feel like characters, they all just feel like empty vessels to move the story forward. Rebecca Ferguson's brat is very underwritten and comes across as a total fool at times. She's always going to crime scenes by herself, she's carrying around this laptop that can record people and she tries to use it to film an encounter with J.K. Simmons by hiding it in the least discreet place you could possibly think. And then there's also Hul's colleagues who briefly help him on his investigation, but they're all very undercharacterized, and they're just randomly introduced into the story about halfway through, and they barely get anything to say or do. But easily the biggest issue of the characters in this one is that the killer's identity is really obvious, and his motivations make no sense. He's going after women that he perceives to be bad mothers because their children don't know who their actual fathers are. Okay then. Why isn't he going after the fathers? In the opening flashback sequence we see that his father is hiding him and his mother in a farmhouse in the middle of nowhere as a result of an affair that he's had and it seems that the father is far worse than the mother, he abuses them and then straight up abandons them, thus driving the mother to suicide. Why doesn't he just go after bad fathers? Maybe that's just the way he thinks but it's also badly conveyed in the actual film. All in all the characterizations in this film are just weak especially with our lead protagonist or killer, and unfortunately not even the performances are good enough to make up for that. Which leads me on to my third point, the performances. So with all the acting talent involved in this film, you'd think the performances would be the strongest aspect of the film. Not quite unfortunately, the performances largely range from slightly stilted to just plain unnatural. Michael Fassbender is one of my favourite actors currently working today, but he's been going through a very rough period as of late, and this might be one of his worst roles to date. Even though you can tell he's trying to make this character work, he's constantly undermined at every turn and just looks bored and miserable throughout. That's not entirely his fault because Hu is such a dull and lifeless character, but it really reflects badly on him and it really sells Fassbender's talents as an actor short. Likewise, Rebecca Ferguson tries very hard in the role of Brass, but she's completely undermined by just how stupid her character can be at times. And Charlotte Gainsborough also looks like she's really trying to make her role as Hul's ex-girlfriend work, but once again she's undone by the material she has to work with. And then you have poor Val Kilmer who looks like he's struggling to get through every scene, because in case you didn't know, Val Kilmer had throat cancer when they were filming this movie, and you can kind of tell because he looks genuinely sick every time he's on screen, and the atrocious dubbing they've done to try and cover that up does him no favours at all. I honestly felt sorry for him every time he showed up in this film. And then there's a lot of other truly fantastic actors in this film that are either completely wasted or exposed by the material. You have Toby Jones who shows up very briefly for about 2 or 3 minutes. Chloe Savini is this woman who goes missing and has a twin she never bothered to mention earlier who shows up completely out of nowhere and then she's gone from the movie afterwards. Even J.K. Simmons who's a fantastic actor comes off badly saddled with doing this weird accent and he's probably the only actor attempting one and that's probably because his accent in this film is really bad. So yeah, the performances aren't exactly brilliant. It's really sad because you can tell the actors are really trying despite the material they have to work with, but they're just defeated by it so often. Although I'm not sure if that's because of the writing or if it's because of the directing, which leads me on to my next point as to why this movie didn't turn out particularly good. The directing. I can see what Alfredson's trying to do with this film. He's trying to make a slow, moody, and atmospheric drama that's more character driven than your average serial killer movie, sort of like a David Fincher film. 
it's just a pity that this really backfires on him in a very big way, and the resulting film is just a meandering and pretentious bore. To Alfredson's credit, there's some really nice looking shots, and there's some good shot compositions in this movie. I really do appreciate his attention to detail in certain places, but that's about it. His directing just makes the movie feel overly artsy, and it does get quite pretentious in places, and it doesn't exactly help that he gives the movie a very pretentious and self-serious tone. It's a very gloomy and depressing movie. And what's worse than the gloomy tone is that his attempts at trying to scare the audience just fall completely flat. Largely because of the basic concept, the idea of someone going around killing people and building snowmen as his calling card is kind of ridiculous. But this movie plays it really straight and I feel like I'm supposed to be scared whenever I see these snowmen, but I wasn't scared at all. Not even remotely. In fact, most of the time whenever I'd see a body with a snowman's head on it, I'd almost burst out laughing. And whereas somebody like David Fincher could bring a real visceral and unsettling edge to this type of material, Alfredson's directing just feels surprisingly toothless. It just feels like a lot of its rougher edges have been shaved off. It also doesn't help that there's a lot of weird moments that feel totally out of place with the rest of the film. Like the strange, almost sex scene with Hul and his ex-girlfriend where he's just like a zombie the entire time. There's also a brief scene where he tries to console a young girl whose mother went missing by doing donkey noises because she's wearing this donkey mask. There's weird uses of novelty music throughout. There's this very awkward fight between Fassbender and Ferguson towards the end. And it's because the film takes itself so goddamn seriously that these bizarre and silly moments really stick out like a sore thumb. I feel like I could talk about many more of these random and unusual moments, but I'd be here forever and I need to finish up this video. I did some research on the film before I went to see it as well as after I saw it, and I found out that Martin Scorsese had been attached to direct the film a few years back. He's even credited as an executive producer in the final cut, and I believe a couple of other directors were considered for the film, including Ridley Scott, Balthazar Comacur, and Morton Tilden. And I'm not sure if Alfredson was really the wrong choice for the material, or if his style of directing just didn't work very well here, but he just dropped the ball big time. It really makes me wonder how the film would have fared if somebody like Scott, or Scorsese, or Fincher, or even the Coen brothers had directed the film. Bottom line, the director in this film tries to go for an atmospheric and moody image that completely backfires, resulting in a boring and pretentiously directed film that's just full on style over substance. And the overly serious tone only draws attention to the many ridiculous scenes that appear throughout the film. But even with all the major flaws of this movie's script, acting, characters, storytelling and directing, there's one major flaw that really serves as a cherry on top of this Sunday. The editing. Fuck me sideways, the editing in this film is appalling. It really feels like this movie is just being edited to hell and back. Large chunks are clearly missing, scenes start and stop abruptly, scenes play like they occur in the wrong order, characters are randomly introduced and then dropped abruptly from the film. The whole film feels like it's been shoved into a blender, then somebody tried to stitch the remains back together, but then some of the stitches came loose so they used glue to stick everything back together, but then the glue dried up so they just sticky taped everything together and then dumped it in the cinemas. The finished film feels like it's barely held together, so much so that it honestly makes Van Borsick and Suicide Squad look comprehensible by comparison. What's interesting is that the film has two separate editor credits. One of these credits is for Thelma Schoonmaker, who's the regular editor for Scorsese. She's a talented editor, but she really doesn't show it here. Although that's not really her fault, because she was probably brought on at a very late stage to try and salvage a movie that wasn't really any good to begin with. And the fact that another editor is credited separately leads me to believe that this movie has passed through the hands of multiple editors. I also found an interview with Alfredson that might explain why the movie is cut together so haphazardly. Alfredson, whenever he addressed the movie's bad reviews, he stated that they didn't get around to shooting 10-15% to of the script during principal photography, stating in his own words that Our shoot time in Norway was way too short, we didn't get the whole story with us, and when we started cutting we discovered that a lot was missing. It's like when you're making a big jigsaw puzzle and a few pieces are missing, so you don't see the whole picture. Alfredson then went on to say that he actually had very little time to plan or prep the movie properly, saying that it happened very abruptly. Suddenly we got noticed that we had the money and could start to shoot in London. That would definitely go a long way in explaining why the movie feels so messy in its story and structure, because not only are scenes blatantly missing or cut out, it seems like they never actually got around to shooting certain scenes too. And that's definitely noticeable in the final film, because not only is there a lot of stuff in the trailers that isn't even in the actual film, but there's also quite a few moments where they've dubbed in dialogue over aerial shots shots that give me reason to believe that the scenes with that dialogue were not actually filmed during the initial shoots. And the haphazard editing might also explain as to why this movie opens with a scene that flat out explains the killer's motivation. 
Because I feel like that scene was meant to occur much later in the film when the killer's identity is actually revealed. But even then, his comments are still quite vague. It's clear that the film is still missing crucial scenes that have more than likely been reshot, but there's just still stuff that has been unfilmed that they managed to shoot that 10 to 15% of the script that off Bredson claims they failed to shoot during principal photography. Was there originally any actual resolution to the whole Winter Games subplot? I don't know. It certainly feels like crucial scenes are missing and it really looks like they're trying to cover that up. Either way, it really speaks volumes as to how muddled the final movie turned out, because it really wasn't planned very well at all. It just goes to show how important planning is when making any film. I could barely get away with making mistakes like this on a student film, so I don't know how the hell anyone was expecting a movie with a fairly big budget to come out in a state that's this unfinished. When watching The Snowman, I get the impression that even if Alfredson had gotten to shoot the entire script the way that he wanted, the movie still probably wouldn't have been all that great, because the script is another major roadblock that keeps this movie from being even remotely good. It's loaded with random subplots, weird moments, and pointless red herrings that are just there to try and distract you from figuring out the mystery before the characters do. That combined with the overly artsy, boarding on pretentious directing probably would have made for a mediocre and disappointing film regardless, but at least it would have been a finished film, and not the sloppy, disjointed, and blatantly unfinished film that's now been dumped into a cinema near you. And it's really sad to see talented people coming together to make something that just doesn't come to life. I know they're hoping to make a franchise out of this character, but I'm dead sure that is never going to happen at this point. It honestly gives me no pleasure to say this, but yeah, this movie is now officially a front runner for my worst of the year list. There's just not that much positive I can say about it, aside from it being a relatively good looking film, and even the effort that I know many of these people are putting into this movie doesn't save it either. The Snowman is probably the most disappointing, frustrating, and manly film I've seen all year, unfortunately, and I'm going to give the film a 2 out of 10. I really can't say that I recommend the film, but if you want to see just how horribly wrong a film can go, despite a considerable amount of talent in front of and behind the camera, check it out if you want to. And I guess to some extent it does serve as a good way to learn how crucial certain aspects are when it comes to making a good film, because without proper planning or preparation, things can go terribly wrong. In that sense, if you're an aspiring filmmaker or you have an interest in film, it definitely serves as good education, but everyone else need not apply. So those are my thoughts on The Snowman and why it turned out the way it did. Have you seen it yet? I hope you haven't, but if you have, what do you think about it? I'm curious to know, and I hope you like the slightly different format for this review. I'd like to do more videos like this in the future as well as splicing things up. I'll be back soon with more videos, but in the meantime, feel free to like the video, leave a comment, and subscribe to my channel. If there's anything I can do to improve my presentation, let me know in the comments below. I can also be found by Facebook, Twitter, email, and Instagram. And until next time, I'm Danny Quinn, and I hope you have a pleasant Halloween.